This is the Pigeon River a century ago, and beyond it is the first headquarters built in 1919, a mile downstream from present headquarters. The two-story farmhouse served until 1935, when the Civilian Conservation Corps built a new headquarters residence that now serves as the Pigeon River Country Discovery Center. William Horsell was the first forester to live in the new headquarters, his youngest son, Lyle, was born in the original building in 1930. They moved when Lyle was five. Lyle later posed with his horse outside the kitchen entrance. Lyle was on hand to see his boyhood home being converted to the Pigeon River Country Discovery Center and to show us around. To find the original 1919 site, we can start from the current headquarters, which we may have reached by taking Sturgeon Valley Road from Vanderbilt. From here, we will look not only at the old homestead site that was dismantled in 1936, but three square miles, about 2% of today's forest running east from that old homestead site. Turn left out of the headquarters driveway and follow the map of Twin Lakes Road to the clearing at Ford Lake Road. Let's stop there. We're parked next to Twin Lakes Road on the west side of the map. The Pigeon River is a few hundred feet to the west, and the three square miles of forest we will explore lie to the east. It's marked on this township map as sections 10, 11, and 12. It's known to the foresters as Compartment 35. The DNR has divided the state forests into compartments. Each year, foresters review six of them in the Pigeon River country. Every 10 years, they start over. Among the features in Compartment 35 are two sinkhole lakes looking like perfect blue circles near the top of the map and Hardwood Lake midway along the bottom boundary. The east boundary of Compartment 35 is at Blue Lakes Road. The west boundary brings us back to the 1920 site of the original headquarters where we parked. Let's look in the clearing for remains of that original homestead. Guided by Lyle Horsell, who lived there from birth to age five, 1930 to 1935. Uh, no, this is the garage. In that picture, you know, it showed the the line of buildings. Yeah. The garage set right here. This is part of the foundation for the garage. Okay. The house set over there looks some trees. Oh, set right in the middle of these. Uh, the, there's the hole where the well was. And that pump was by about 10, 10 feet from the back door of the house. Big hand pump. Yeah. They had a ram in the river right down here. Or not, not in the river, in the creek down there. Where is the river from here? Over in that way. Right down there, yeah. Yeah. Somewhere in that direction. That tall spruce tree right there? Yeah, that big tall one. There was two, but the top broke out of the other one, so there's only one you can see now. And that was planted by the front door when you were a kid? Mm-hmm. Let's see how vegetation has obscured the view from the Pigeon River of the old headquarters complex. We'll turn the map to orient with our drone camera view.
This photo was taken from the west side of the river, near where culverts were later placed in the river to create a bridge known as the Tubes. Some of Forrester Horsell's children posed on an earlier bridge and were photographed apparently holding nozzles of water being pumped from the river. By 2018, the tubes were in need of repair or replacement, though they still looked scenic to visitors. Pigeon River Country has 61 compartments. Number 35 is near the center, colored orange on this map. We can take Twin Lakes Road North to the Twin Sinkhole Lakes. From above, it is clear how perfectly round they are. On a winter afternoon, the tree shadows point north on snow-covered twin circles. North and South Twin Lakes are two of eight identified sinkhole lakes in the Pigeon River country. They have the classic round shape with very steep banks. From the parking area, it's a short walk on the high ground between North and South Twin, which are situated modestly among the pines and hardwoods when we look for them on a fall day. Minerals easily dissolved by acid water occasionally lie in formations beneath the forest, part of karst systems stretching eastward to Lake Huron. When a formation has been dissolved into a cave underground, the cave roof can collapse, leaving a depression that sometimes fills into a lake at the surface. The Pigeon sinkhole lakes are 30 to 60 feet deep, with water looking a rather stunning milky blue-green from dissolved gypsum, and fed by underground springs. Just northwest of the Twin Lakes is part of the Elk Hill Equestrian Campground. The shore-to-shore -shore equestrian trail runs along the north and east boundaries of Compartment 35, bringing curious horses and their riders to all the vehicle roads and their own marked trails, but not on the other pathways inside the forest. Hardwood Lake is a shallow body of water formed by a glacier. Hardwood Lake has a microenvironment that preserves boreal or northern vegetation around its shores. Access is just a little east of where Tin Shanty Road intersects Hardwood Lake Road coming up from the south. The access is quite rustic in keeping with the remote character of the lake. Numbered roads in the Pigeon are invitations to enter more remote forest on what are mostly two-track routes. The Ys will make sure their vehicle has enough clearance and four-wheel drive, or will park and walk with a compass and a map. Half, 900, of the 1,800 acres of trees in the compartment are 80 to 90 years old. None are more than 110 years old. 10% are less than 10 years old. The terrain is gently rolling with some steeper hills under the hardwoods in sections 11 and 12. The predominant soil under the hardwoods is Leelanau loamy sand. Elsewhere, it's mostly grayling and Rubicon sands. Plus, there are peats and mucks along the Pigeon River and around Hardwood Lake. Just below the compartment 35 surface, is 200 to 600 feet depth of glacial drift from 10,000 years ago. Below the glacial till, outwash sand and alluvium is the Devonian Antrim Shale that is quarried outside the forest for cement products. There are 68 identified forested stands in compartment 35. In the last inventory in 2014, Greg Rakowski counted 634 acres of northern hardwoods and 433 acres of red pine, but only 26 acres of oak, all of it 80 to 90 years old, and 49 acres of cedar, all of it 90 to 100 years old. 
This has been a look at three square miles out of more than 170 square miles constituting the Pigeon River country, a forest that seems large from the perspective of humans who can live comfortably in 1,200 square feet of dwelling, not really so large for female black bears who need two to 10 square miles of virtually roadless country to be comfortable and healthy, and male bears whose home range averages 60 square miles and whose interests take them sometimes hundreds of miles beyond that. More than twice the total acreage of the pigeon burned up in California wildfires in 2017. And by September 2018, nearly four times that much California forest was lost to fire, even before the peak fire season. The Pigeon River country is indeed an increasingly rare treasure. This stand of young jack pine actually was a result of a wildfire. So the notes say in actually 1987, this entire stand, which when you look at it from the aerial imagery, I think it's about 60 acres total, um, had a wildfire run through. And then after the fire, um, there was a salvage harvest where they came through and harvested the, uh, you know, the dead trees. But there was no replanting done here. And, you know, jack pine is a fire-dependent species, so as you can see, pretty much the entire stand just came back. Tones open for fire. Still open, sometimes without fire, you know, so you'll still get natural seeding. But they really like fire, so when the fire comes through and if they're loaded with tones, they just open right up and the seed releases. So in ecological terms, that's how a stand would regenerate without forestry. Present. Um, you know, but jack pine you typically hosts a whole different suite of species than other forests. You know, mm -hmm. so we see the drier. Yep. That's a blueberry. Sweet fern. And then we have the young bracken fern coming up. Here's a service berry, which just grows up into a nice shrub and produces berries. Um, and if we just look behind us, we have a, a black cherry. So this is, you know, obviously a very beneficial shrub species. So that's kind of, you know, when we have an early successional forest like this, you get a flush of shrubs and new, new regrowth. So that's one of the good things about having these younger forests on the landscape. Okay, my name's uh, Greg Rakowski. I'm the forester out here in the Pigeon. So this is my sixth year out here. And as a forester, what exactly do you do, Craig? Um, well, we have two here in the Pigeon, and I manage the south half of the forest, and so I collect all the inventory data in the winter, and then uh, set up all the timber sales in the spring, summer, mostly. So mm -hmm. Pretty much hiking around and just looking at the forest, collecting data, you know, how dense it is, if it's healthy, what species, um, what's growing underneath. This is mostly a red pine stand. Um, this was planted. I, I believe CCC era, it's about 85 years old. Um, it's had a harvest before, back in the 80s, where they there was some jack pine mixed in too that they planted, and basically the harvest, previous harvest was to take all the jack pine out. So, But now we have another harvest set up. Um, this is a seed tree harvest. So any trees marked with green are being left. So the idea here, most of the trees are going to be taken out, um, except for the green trees, and those trees will provide seed for a new stand. Um, red pine, similar to jack pine, you know, it loves sunlight and needs a lot of sunlight, and it requires a lot of ground disturbance or fire. Um, so what we're going to do here through the, our contract is we're going to require the logger to chip it, which they have a piece of equipment which has to drag stuff along the ground, which will tear up the ground. And the red pine seed really likes bare mineral soil. So you're trying to get trying to get through this organic layer down to the sand. 
And so hopefully through the logging, which they usually tear the ground up pretty well when they chip, it'll provide a nice seed bed for the red pine. So typically red pine is planted in plantations just because that's the economical way to do it. Um, natural re red pine regeneration is usually pretty difficult to get. Um, but through the concept of management out here in the Pigeon, that's kind of our goal is to primarily go for natural regeneration. You know, we don't really plant a lot of plantations anymore. So. And we'll have a mix of other species, which is kind of what we want to. We kind of, you know, there's some nice young white pine right here. We don't want a pure, a pure plant, you know, uniform distribution of just red pine. We'd like to see this white pine in here. We'll probably get some of this jack pine. There's already some little ones here. Um, red maple, you can see some beech. We'll probably have a little bit of that mixed in too. American beech. Little red maple behind us here. Here's one. And also an oak too. We're, there are some oak in here. There's not many bigger ones, but we're leaving all the bigger oak along with the red pine, so hopefully we can get some of these young oak in here too. Yep. So it's going to look a lot different in the future, um, but you know, diversity is a good thing. The economic value won't be nearly as much, which is kind of the trade-off. I mean, these trees here are very high quality. A lot of telephone pole, be a lot of telephone poles taken out of here, which are the, the most valuable tree a red pine, red pine can be. So, you know, dense, forested, cover, you know, mature trees, you know, those provide yeah. habitat for songbirds and, you know, yeah. gosh hawks and yeah. things like that. So. I don't really notice how much my ears ring until I get into a place like this. Mm. Then it's like, wow, it's so quiet. Mm -hmm. The part that looks like field now was burned? Yep, yep, we burned this um, last spring, so spring of 2017. Um, prior to that, the stand was kind of like a brushy opening. It had a lot of this cherry. You can see all this young growth, this cherry that's grown up since then. And what, um, this was wildlife di division. Um, you know, they managed the openings. And what they did is they had the Rough Grouse Society come through with a little machine, yeah, which uh, knocks down all the brush. So you can kind of see some of the, the slash still remaining. Um, mm -hmm. And they just wanted to set it back and then burn it to retain it as an opening. I, I was amazed how well the milkweed responded to the fire, you know, which is a host plant for the monarch. So, yeah. it, it's, you know, fire is a good thing. It's something we need more of on the landscape, so. But. How many people participate in this burn like that? Um, quite a few, probably 15 at least. So we have a control line that we put around the edge with a bulldozer. And then we have the trucks that we monitor to make sure the fire doesn't go on the other side, you know. Then we have people, you know, with the torches running back and forth, lighting everything on fire. How do you put stuff out? The water, the trucks have water. The yep. water. Yep. Yeah. So, but usually we let most of it just burn and it's usually, you know, a long day. We'll be here until, you know, close to midnight. I think we're here on this burn, so. Oh. And then mm -hmm. anything, anything that's near the patrol line, we make sure it's out before we leave. You know, and then we come back the next day, the fire, the fire guys do. It's a fire prone species, so it responds really well to fire. And what's it called? Uh, little blue. Little, little blue, blue stem. stem. Any of the little uh, cherries that are coming up, those are all trees that had been cut through the hydro axe. So the goal would be to come through, hydro axe the area, get to some vegetation growing with the open sunlight and then come back in a couple years later and burn it because once you have a fuel load built up, then you can burn it and that'll further stimulate the grasses, the native grasses like this little blue stem here. So for, further stimulate that with, with the fire. So originally those were trees, they were hydroaxed down and burned. Those were as tall as the ones that are standing. So we left scattered larger soft mast trees to still provide the soft mast within the opening. You can see all this dead mm -hmm. grass. Well, once we get a two or three year growing season and it's dead grass, that'll be enough fuel load in there that once that burns through, it'll kill them cherries off or at least keep them at bay to maintain this mm -hmm. as an opening. Mm -hmm. So you really have to build your fuel loads, burn it, and that'll help kill the woody stems. Mm -hmm. The heat will melt the bark on them and, and uh, knock them back. And then you'll be able to just burn it every Three to four, three to five years to maintain it as an opening. For us, um, the three, the big three for opening management in, in this particular area is um, elk, 
white-tailed deer and wild turkey because that's where we get our funding through um, from turkey licenses or elk licenses or deer licenses. You want to focus on them, but when you are managing for those big three, you're also managing for a lot of other species. Rough grouse, um, woodcock, you saw northern flickers we just saw here, um, a number of other neotropical um, nesting songbirds that like and utilize openings. Um, raptors utilize openings for hunting for prey. You know, like a particular grassland like this, um, for elk, they were elk were in here all winter pawing for the grasses, these green grasses. Um, and then once spring breaks out, deer and elk are in here because it's the first thing that greens up. So they're coming off a harsh winter. So they need a green food right away. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the spring, you know, this is a great area for calving or fawning. Mm. Um, so that they would be used this for reproduction. Also wild turkey, um, rough grouse will, will nest on the edge. Wild turkey will nest right out in the grass. Um, mm. American woodcock will utilize these openings for um, painting for their reproductive display. So they'll, we have some aspen stands on the edge. They'll come out to the openings, do their display right before dark. And then usually they will nest on the edge of an opening next to a lot of stems. So lots of lots of species. And, and then even this time of year, if you walk through here, you'll notice there's grasshoppers everywhere. So like for a wild turkey or rough grouse, the first 15 days of either the wild turkey poults or the rough grouse chicks, all they eat is insects and invertebrae. So when you can come out, when they can bring their chicks out in here, they have cover from predators and they can be picking insects. Very important because those first 15 days is the most crucial for their survival. And insects are super high in protein and that's why they're, that's all they eat their first 15 days because they want to grow as fast as they can those first few days. So, you know, and that's through the summer months. Of course, you'll see elk out here um, and deer um, browsing still on the green. Uh, through the summer, through the fall, elk will utilize this area for breeding. You know, they're, they like open spaces to be able to keep keep track of their harems. You know, they'll be bugling out here, wallowing, fighting. So it's a reproductive um, advantage for them to be in more an open country. Mm -hmm. They get up on the side hills, they are able to bugle, attract mates. Um, you know, you, you do something and initially, when I first started, I was managing for elk primarily, but then once you start walking through some of these areas and you see the whole suite of species that actually utilize some of the habitat management that we do, mm -hmm. it's kind of eye-opening for you. This is a popular area for a lot of folks to come through and view elk. So, you know, that's another thing that we manage for in the Pigeon River country is recreational opportunities. Mm -hmm. So to be able to see animals out in the open these openings provide that the animals want to be there and then people in turn are able to view them so that's very important um, thing that we do and then you going into the, the winter months they'll come out and paw through the snow into these openings and for mm. forage so it really provides um, a habitat component for a lot of species through uh, the four seasons that we have up here you know another benefit of grasslands is um, if you look over there, you can see some milkweed coming up. So, monarch will come in here, lay their eggs, caterpillar will hatch, eat the milkweed, and um, that'll start their process of, you know, they reproduce in like a five stage process and migrate down to Mexico, but they gotta have them up here to start the process and work their way down. So, hey Dale. He's got a caterpillar. One of our caterpillars. So how's the caterpillar? How did he find his way out here? He didn't have a map. <laughs> you know, Pigeon River concept of management has um, criteria in it that we need to, you know, manage for six to seven percent openings. So this mm -hmm. is part of that process. <laughs> yeah. What have you got there? Soft uh, pin cherries. Pin cherries. So once these ripen up, a lot of birds will eat these. Bears will come in here and you'll see limbs rip down. Mature oak there. And being though those are out here in the open, they'll develop this big, huge canopy that they wouldn't have in a tree setting. So they'll really produce a lot more acorns as they develop limbs out. 
mm -hmm. and spread out and become a huge canopy oak, which will provide a lot of forage. Acorns are pretty important to wildlife, all wildlife. In these troubling times, it's challenging to find a way forward. In this my 81st year, I feel it necessary to offer my best assessment of how to meet the challenge. It involves stepping outside. That is where the most complex and the simplest work is underway to deal with all the things we face living in this world. My fervent hope is that we get in contact with the natural world, observe it, feel it working, and ponder its meaning. To do this, we need to get the natural world as pure and as direct as we can manage. Pigeon River Country is one such place. What is going on there is more profound, more incredible than we can imagine. The outdoors operates without any guidance from humans. Our efforts can have some minimal benefit or, at our worst, catastrophic consequence. The outdoors displays a system at work independent of our planning. It makes its own executive decisions, providing sustenance and balance with no need to ask for our counsel. Life forms of unimaginable sizes and complexity operate effectively while we sleep or work at other things. When we look closely, we see what looks to us like those things that are already familiar from our human way of seeing. Most of what goes on outdoors is invisible to us. We read about it or see an occasional nature film that informs us a little about what we're missing. When we stand still in a forest, our first impressions are that not much is happening at all. Maybe some breeze in the leaves, some swaying of trees, some bird sounds, maybe things getting wet in the rain. Yet we benefit just by being in it, whether or not we are paying attention to the unfolding of life all around us by everything from bacteria to bears, from molecules of air stirring in the wind to water on the move, and even to the planet rotating in its own weather as it spins through the universe. We don't see the microorganisms, and seldom the mammals, or even the fish or birds, unless we purposely go looking for them. We can learn what science is discovering about trees acting in communities with other trees and with fungi and other compatriots, going about their business together in root systems beneath the surface. Systems that can be more complex than the greatest of human minds. Systems that can extend over many acres and persevere for centuries. We say it's quiet or peaceful or pretty or refreshing. It's also profound and something we are part of, something that is essential to our being. I once spoke tentatively about awareness all around us. I said, I believe evidence is accumulating that awareness is quite basic and more similar in all other life forms than we might imagine. I am more sure of that than ever. Evidence is still accumulating, but I can apply my own modest awareness and marvel at the outdoors, at the ongoing life of a forest just by standing there.